Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast, a Canadian real estate podcast that shows you how to pay off your mortgage sooner and live well while doing it. Now, here's your host, Sean Cooper. Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. I'm Sean Cooper, and it's great to be here for the very first episode of the show. On today's show, I'll be talking to Chantel Chapman. Chantel is a millennial money and credit score expert with a background in the mortgage industry. She was a mortgage broker for over a decade and has been teaching financial literacy for 10 years. Chantel is the founder of WT Finances, financial literacy and advice for millennials looking to get their money right. WT Finances is backed by science-based research in addiction and behavior to explore how consumerism and mental health are linked to money problems. It's a rather unique story of how this podcast episode came to be. I recently had the honor of being featured in the cover story of Toronto Life magazine. The story, The Young Buyers Club, was on millennials who managed to buy a house in Toronto before age 30. When I read the article, something seemed off. While there were a couple female home buyers who owned properties with their male partners, there weren't any single female home buyers featured in the article. I'm not the only one who noticed. My friend Chantel noticed too, so after exchanging a few messages on Instagram, we decided to record a podcast episode to encourage single females to buy homes too. In my interview with Chantel, we discuss buying a home as a single female, closing the gender pay gap, and the steps of purchasing a home on your own. Without further ado, here's my interview with Chantel Chapman. Hi, Chantel. How are you doing today? I'm good, Sean. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thanks. I'm excited to be talking about this topic with you, female home buying. Yeah, me too. Great. So when you came across the Young Buyers Club article in Toronto Life magazine, something seemed off to you. I'm glad I'm not the only one who noticed. Can you tell us what that was? Yeah, so when I saw the photo, I think on your Instagram or Facebook, I noticed right away that there was only, how many people were in that photo, 10? Yeah, I believe it was uh, 10. They had two couples in in the photo there. Yeah, so there were 10 people in the photo and there was only two females. And um, I noticed the article was about um, people buying a home under 30. So I was like, that's odd. The, how, why are there so many men and not a lot of females? So I opened up the article and I was really disappointed to see that the two women that were featured in the article were featured as buying a home with the male. There was no females who were purchasing by themselves. So I didn't think that was a very good representation of, you know, females being able to be um, independent and go out and buy their own home. I was a mortgage broker for a very long time and I still consult for a mortgage company um, right now and we definitely have females that buy homes under 30. I have uh, friends that are females that are have bought or currently looking to buy who are under 30 so I didn't think it was a fair representation. It definitely, that uh, struck me as odd as well. I mean, um, I don't have the exact statistics of how many single males versus single females purchase homes in Toronto, but I would think it's more than one. Well, yeah, and even if, it, even if it's a bit of a challenge to find females under 30 who have bought by themselves, um, and it's easier to find a man, I feel that like mainstream media has a bit of a responsibility to kind of create more of an inclusive narrative, you know, like maybe work a little bit harder to find a female. So when females are reading this article, they don't look at it like, do I not, 
do I not have a chance because no other females are doing it? And not only that, like, also, if we could see uh, females that are of color as well buying, you know, like, controlling that narrative and, and influencing and inspiring females to go out and buy is a good thing, you know, because I didn't feel very inspired by that article. On that topic there, uh, buying a home as a single person is challenging enough as it is. Do you think it's realistic for a female to aspire to buy a home on her own in a big city like Toronto and uh, Vancouver? And I guess you touched on that, that you had some friends, but why don't you um, elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so I mean, what you kind of said at the beginning of this question is, is key, like buying a home as a single person is challenging. You know, like, especially in some of the big cities like Toronto and Vancouver, it's so expensive. So a lot of people are buying together, whether you're a male or female. Dual income is super helpful to get into a hot real estate market. But as a female, I think it is super realistic for them to aspire to buy. And if they can't buy something in this in the big city that they work in, and if they can't find something that is maybe smaller, that is a stepping stone in their real estate career, then and when I say real estate career, I mean, you know, this is an investment, you're buying an asset, and when you buy your first home, it's not the home that you're gonna live in forever. You know, look at it as this is a stepping stone to something else that you might get, you might want to get in the future. If they can't find anything like that, you know, there's, there are opportunities outside, outside of the city. Yeah, totally. I think you have to be flexible in this real estate market and consider yeah. all your options. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the saying, driving until you qualify. Like, if you're just so close-minded that you want a specific type of property, like a house uh, near the downtown, then I, th I think you're going to be looking for a long time. Yeah. Great. So there's actually something very interesting. StatsCan released its 2017 housing report, and it actually found that women own more properties than men. Now, this is um, not just single females owning properties. It's women that own properties alone, as well as women that own properties with men and other family members. So all women together. It found that in Vancouver, women own 53.8% of all residential properties, while in Ontario, women own 52.4% of residential properties. And I guess this makes sense because there are more women than men in Canada, but still this is encouraging. Um, but despite this, female home buying is a relatively new phenomenon on, on its own. Uh, women face a unique set of personal and social pressures that can make the process of buying a home more difficult and challenging for them than it otherwise would be for a single man or family. Why do you think that single ladies should still strive to own homes on their own? So, yeah, okay, so that stat that women, there's more women homeowners doesn't actually surprise me, especially now. Um, there, I was reading, there was this other uh, popular website in Canada that um, was looking at data on their traffic, and they looked at 6 million browsing, browsing sessions, and they found that the majority of um, people searching for homes were women. 60% were women, 40% men. I think when you reference, you know, what are some of the social pressures that might hold women back from buying? I think it's like narratives, you know, there's this narrative around men are in control of the finances and women are not. So that's a long time narrative that's been around that women are working through. And we're seeing women work through that very fast. Like that is slipping. But when you see articles like, like the Toronto Life article, it's kind of going against changing that narrative, right? So that's the one thing that women need to do is they need to just have the belief that they can, they can do it if they actually build the steps to do it. Right. So having the belief that you can't do it is not a good start. And other pressures might be, you know, you, you're taught like the gender pay gap, obviously like women are making less than men and 
that obviously is going to impact affordability. That, that definitely can be an issue as well, which means that they might not qualify for as much. There is also other pressures. I was, I'm actually going to be doing an interview um, with uh, like a TV show next week where they want to talk about how women have this pressure to buy more things than men to keep up appearances. Like, you know, how much does it cost for your haircut versus my haircut? Things like that. So there's a little bit more overspending with women than there are with men in some cases. So obviously that can impact someone saving up for a down payment or, you know, just being able to think that they could actually afford a higher mortgage payment. No, totally. I, I get that. Um, so yeah, I, women definitely have different challenges, but certainly don't give up. I mean, uh, you know, uh, just wish that the Toronto Life article had been more representative as of the population, like you had mentioned. So yeah, absolutely. Because the stat, the stats do show it, and also, and like I said, if it is a challenge, as a uh, as a mainstream uh, media publication, like do the work to help in create a more inspiring narrative for women. And you mentioned in your last answer about the pay gap between men and women. Perhaps you could talk a bit more about that and how women can uh, counteract that and help close the pay gap because it certainly does exist and there's statistics to prove it, but you know, um, it seems that it is closing, but it's not really closing fast enough and it does affect how much you qualify in terms of a mortgage, but you know, how can women really counteract that in terms of qualifying for a mortgage as well as in their current career, what can they do to kind of help close the gap? According to um, a recent study, the pay gap is a 26% gap between men and females. My, my advice for um, that is it comes down to negotiation. You know, like there's been a lot of research around women and negotiation. And, you know, women, according to the statistics, don't negotiate as much for salaries. So that's one place to start. Like, a lot of people and a lot of employers are aware of the gender pay gap and it's just not as acceptable anymore, right? So I think women have much more of an, a voice to negotiate and to do some research and what, what are men making for that same job and ask and negotiate because women deserve that salary if it is the same job, right? Those negotiation skills that are developed and used to create more income for yourself also will play into, you know, helping to negotiate pre the purchase price when you're buying a home. So it's a really, really good skill to have for a female. Totally. And um, of course, income and down payment come into play when it comes to qualifying for property. So if you're not making as much money and you can't save as big of a down payment, it certainly affects the affordability of your housing. Absolutely. Great. So on the topic of affordability, condos are a popular entry point for single home buyers due to their relative affordability. What are some factors to consider when buying a home on your when buying a condo on your own? So I, I'm from Vancouver and um, in Vancouver, uh, condos can be sometimes a bit risky when you're buying it because depending on what year the condo was built, there is the potential for the, the envelope of the building to have issues. Um, and if that condo and the structure of the building has issues, what's gonna happen is the strata council um, or the condo council could potentially do an assessment and there could be a large fee that the homeowner is required to pay. So when you're looking at purchasing a condo, whether it is in BC or in Ontario, you really need to do your due diligence on looking at all the past condo minutes and making sure that you understand, is there any potential issues that might come up that might cost you more in the future? So yeah, it will be a little bit less to buy, um, but you really need to make sure you feel comfortable with the structure of that building and there's going to be no large assessment piece coming up in the future. Another thing with condos too that people don't often think about is 
when you buy a condo, you know, you have your mortgage on the condo and you have your mortgage payment and you have your property taxes. Um, but there's another fee called the condo fee or the maintenance fee. That fee could be a few hundred dollars. I mean, it could even be $700 depending on what amenities your building has. So if you are on a tight budget, you know, you might not want to be going with a building that has uh, two swimming pools and a restaurant and the, the most high-end gym because you're going to pay for that within your, your maintenance or your condo fees. And that could be, obviously, that's hard on the budget if you're on a tighter budget, but also it impacts how much you can afford because the mortgage lender is going to add that into your qualifying ratios. If you are on a tight budget, a building with uh, less amenities is probably better. Yeah, totally. And it also makes it difficult to resell your condo when you're going to sell later on if it has really high condo fees. So certainly, uh, as we were mentioning previously, uh, your condo is probably not going to be your forever property. So you want to think about resale value as well. Yeah, absolutely. Resale value is really, really important. Great. So buying a home is a lot more involved than the real estate shows on TV would lead us to believe. Walk us through the steps of buying a home on your own. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do when you buy a home is you need to get pre-approved for a mortgage. So a lot of people, and I don't know why people do this, but they approach buying a home like they, they approach buying a car. So you go to the car lot, you find your perfect vehicle, and then you go and sit in the finance office and you figure out if you can qualify for it. That, that is not how it works with buying a home. There is no point to waste your time and waste the realtor's time to look at a bunch of properties if there's no chance that you can afford that property. So getting pre-approved as your very first step is really, really important. And if you work with a bank or a mortgage broker, what you want to do is you want to ask them to pre-approve you for a few different scenarios. So for example, I mentioned if you buy a condo, there's going to be maintenance fees. So what I would ask them is I would say, tell me how much I would qualify for for purchase price with a lower maintenance fee condo versus a higher maintenance fee condo. And then also, how much would I qualify for purchase price for a home that didn't have a maintenance fee and see the difference? And then how much would I qualify for a home that has a rental suite? So it's really good to look at those different scenarios. Don't just go and get like a quick pre-approval and be like, I qualify for this much because there's so many different elements to a mortgage pre-qualification to consider. Like if you have rental income from a suite, you're going to qualify for more mortgage, right? So that's super, super important. Another thing that I would say too is shop around on your pre-approval. Talk to your bank or your credit union, but also talk to a broker because the thing is, is the banks are not always going to necessarily give you the best deal right off the bat. And brokers work with mul multiple lenders and their whole job is to represent you in the buying process and find you the perfect mortgage for your situation. And another thing I want to say on that is a lot of times Banks and brokers will tell you, make sure you don't have your credit pulled multiple times for shopping for a mortgage. Otherwise, it'll lower your credit score. That is actually not true because the credit bureau has um, basically tagged mortgage checks in a way that if you have multiple credit checks for the purpose of a mortgage within a short period of time, it only counts as one because the credit bureau does recognize it is a smart thing to do to shop around for your mortgage. And sometimes, unfortunately, mortgage brokers and banks will tell customers, you know, make sure you don't have multiple credit checks for a mortgage because it might scare the customer from shopping around, but that's just, that is a myth. So it's important to kind of do your due diligence and making sure you're working with people that you feel comfortable with. And then once you've done that, then you're going to talk to a realtor and you're going to spend a lot of time with a realtor. So you want to make sure this is someone that you can 
tolerate, I guess, <laughs> and, uh, and get along with, and they communicate well to you. But not only that, um, it's not just on a personal level, but what is that realtor's experience in the property that you want to buy? So now that you've looked at different scenarios with the mortgage broker, uh, you know, like, well, you know what, I'm going to focus in on a home, or I'm definitely going to focus in on a condo with, a lower, with lower amenities. So now you can take that to a realtor that specializes in that type of property. That's some great advice. Thanks so much for that. Now, research shows that women are less likely to negotiate than men. How can women become better real estate negotiators? So I kind of mentioned this when I was talking about the gender pay gap. First of all, like negotiation comes with a little bit of confidence. So you have to believe that you have the ability to do so. And sometimes I find that women may not negotiate because they feel like they don't know enough about the subject um, when it comes to things like real estate. And you have to understand that people don't expect you to be the real estate expert or the mortgage expert. And to negotiate doesn't mean that you have to be an expert in that, that subject. It just means that you need to ask the right questions and do your due diligence. And if you feel like what's being offered is not fair and you want to go lower, just ask. Just ask for it and see what happens. I would say also have that top price in mind that you're willing to pay because when you're kind of in the heat of the moment and you might be in a multiple offer situation, you don't want to end up paying more than you expected to. So definitely have that top price in mind. And I'd say make sure that you have your comparable properties. And that all comes back to dealing with a competent realtor because uh, speaking from personal experience, my first realtor didn't give me comparable properties. So I was kind of going in blind with uh, one property. But if you have a great realtor, then that shouldn't be an issue. Absolutely. And and it also comes back to making step one, your mortgage pre-approval, like a thorough mortgage pre-approval, because that'll help you kind of determine your top price. And one thing to know too is in some cases, you may qualify for way more than you actually want to spend. So don't just focus on your max mortgage amount. Always focus on the payment. How does the payment work within your budget? So what is your top, what is your top payment? And, you know, figure out exactly what the mortgage payments would be and crunch all the other numbers that come out along with home ownership and see if that would work with your budget. Because, yeah, I mean, I could have spent up to $500,000 on a property, but once I crunched the numbers, uh, I wasn't comfortable spending that amount and I decided to only spend four twenty five. So I definitely take the time to crunch the numbers and, you know, you don't want to be house rich, cash poor without any money to travel or go out to restaurants or do any of that fun stuff. So yeah, it's a great piece of advice. Absolutely. Great. So if you'd like to pay off your mortgage sooner, you might consider renting out a spare bedroom in your house or condo. What are some considerations as a single female homeowner when renting out your place? Well, I think one um, thing that's really important is to establish very clear boundaries up front. So, you know, spending some time thinking about what would this relationship between me and the tenant look like for me to feel comfortable and making sure that's all laid out in your lease and, and make sure you have a proper tenancy agreement or lease agreement that lays out all the rules so you are protected as the landlord. Yeah, definitely. And depending on the province where you live, there may be uh, like a standard uh, tenant landlord agreement, but definitely do your homework, uh, go online and perhaps speak with your realtor and they can help you out with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like sometimes people think, well, it's just my roommate, you know, renting the room and it's a friend maybe. So they may think, oh, I don't need this, but you definitely should have it. No different than, you know, if you as a female homeowner buys a place and your boyfriend moves in, you know, have a rent, have a, a rental agreement between the two of you if that person is going to be contributing to the mortgage payment. Great. So when you're buying a condo, it's not likely to be your forever home, as we mentioned earlier. You never know when you're going to meet Mr. Wright or Miss Wright, I guess, for a guy. But yeah, we're talking about females, so we'll say Mr. Wright. But what are some or, or Mrs. Wright? <laughs> yeah, or Mrs. Wright. It's 2018. Uh, yeah. 
what are some factors to look for to help maximize your resale value? Well, make sure you don't do any um, renovations that are very, very unique to your taste. (laughs) That's probably a big one. I've seen people take apartments and do some structural changes within it that turn a two bedroom into a very, very large one bedroom. And then, you know, all of a sudden it impacts the resale value because the property is quite large. So they're looking for the price of a two bedroom, but because it's only one bedroom, it kind of, it lowers the price that they're going to get for it. So thinking about things like that is important. Yeah, definitely. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, maintenance fees and condo fees are important. And you also want to make sure that you have a competent condo board. So definitely do your research on that and make sure that your real estate lawyer basically finds out if the condo is in good financial standing, uh, as well as perhaps even speak to some of the residents in the condo, just get their thoughts on how the condo board operates. You've probably heard of office politics, but there could be condo board politics as well. So you don't want to buy into a situation like that. At least I wouldn't want to. Absolutely. Are there any other tips that you'd like to add, Chantel? Yeah, so I think one thing that I just want to elaborate on a little bit is the down payment. So um, when we're talking about social pressures that women face or things that women are dealing with that might impact them buying a home, and I I quickly mentioned um, overspending with women and the cost of kind of things for women can be a little bit more expensive. Sometimes like there's a lot of pressure on women um, with social media and marketing messages to, you know, look a certain way. And there's also this, this message around never feeling pain and always making sure that if you do feel pain and you've had a stressful day or whatever, treat yourself, like buy yourself a new dress or buy yourself a new pair of shoes or go out to dinner with friends, you know, so you feel better. And I think it's really important. Like if you are on a, if you do want to buy a home and Saving for the down payment is one of the things that are kind of a bit of a challenge for you is to really look deeply at that and really look deeply at your overspending and why are you spending the way that you're spending and ask yourself, am I buying these things because there's a, there's a narrative that's telling me I need to do this to fit in? I need to, you know, have this type of makeup or these type of clothes or, you know, I'm, I'm going for a, this new job interview, so I have to buy an entire brand new out, outfit. Like purchases like that can sometimes come from a place where you're trying to avoid pain or you're trying to comfort something that actually spending is not really going to comfort. And if it does comfort it, it's just temporary. So I think it's very, very important on the path of saving for any big investment or anything you want to do. Like if you want to save to go on a big trip to travel around Europe and you're having a challenge or you want to save for down payment and you're having challenges, it's so important to come back to that because if you have a lack of savings, it's because you're probably overspending. So look at that relationship between your spending and how you're actually feeling inside. That's great. And speaking from the perspective of a guy, uh, I definitely feel the pressure as well, but maybe not as much as women. Yeah, I I can't speak for guys. (laughs) (laughs) So it's been great having you on the show today. Before I let you go, is there anything of interest that you're working on that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I guess people can uh, follow me at What the Finance Is. Um, My website is whatthefinances.ca. I'm a mindful money coach, and I'm just about to be launching a mindful money online class the end of summer with another company that I own called School by KMP. But the info for it is on my website, What the Finance Is. Great. And I'll make sure that's included in the show notes. Boy, you seem like a pretty busy person. (laughs) You too, Sean. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Uh, So (laughs) great. Thanks so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, you wanting to talk about this too. And and I really appreciate, you know, when I brought this up to you, how, you know, I, I thought it was really cool that you're like, you know, I recognize this too. And I happily would have given my place up for another female. That was, that was a nice thing that you said. So that was good. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Burn Your Mortgage podcast. Besides being a podcast host and money coach, 
I'm also a licensed mortgage broker. If you or anyone you know, family, friends, co-workers, or neighbors could ever use any unbiased mortgage advice or a second opinion, feel free to reach out. You can reach me by email at seancooperwriter at gmail.com or you can call or text me at 647-867-3711. Also, be sure to head on over to www.seancooperwriter.com and sign up for my free weekly newsletter. As a small token of my appreciation, you'll be able to download my ultimate mortgage checklist on choosing the perfect mortgage. You can also sign up for a free one-on-one 15-minute money coaching consultation with yours truly. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you burn your mortgage sooner too. Once again, thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating. Until next time, happy mortgage burning.